Good evening. On behalf of the Institute of Politics and the Kennedy School, I'd like to welcome all of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Jean Shaheen. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. To begin this evening, I'd like to recognize some very important people who are especially important to tonight's event. First, the patron saint of the Institute of Politics, Senator Ted Kennedy, and his wife, Vicki. <laughs> Let me ask you to hold your applause, and I'd like to recognize Kennedy School Dean David Elwood, and Institute of Politics <laughs> Senior Advisory Committee members Heather Campion and Caroline Kennedy. For those of you who don't know about the Institute of Politics, it is a living memorial to President John Kennedy. Our mission is to engage young people in politics and public service. Tonight, as we discuss the intersection of culture and politics and the magazine that John Kennedy created a decade ago, George, I would also like to recognize John's strong commitment to the Institute of Politics. John was an active and engaged member in the IOP Senior Advisory Committee for 16 years. He presided over numerous forums in this space, and it is fittingly called the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Before introducing our next speaker, I would just like to announce to the audience that, unfortunately, due to the weather and to radar problems at Logan Airport, panelists Judy Woodruff and Katrina Vanden Heuvel will not be able to join us this evening. Now, I would like to introduce the person who really made this event tonight happen, the president of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and a member of the Institute of Politics Senior Advisory Committee Caroline Kennedy. Thank you all. Thank you, Jean. And thank you, Dean Elwood, for hosting all of us here tonight. Um, it's hard to believe that it has been 10 years since John launched George Magazine. Um, we are here tonight to discuss its premise, its impact, and the current state of culture and politics. But I would like to say a few words about what the magazine meant to John personally. Starting George, a lifestyle magazine aimed primarily at women and young people, was a bold and unconventional move, which is why it was perfect for John. It combined his interests and allowed him to channel people's expectations and the pressures on him to enter politics in his own direction. It was fun, inspiring, controversial, intellectually stimulating, creative, and hard work, just like John. And in its time, it was the center of attention and debate, just where John liked to be. John particularly enjoyed reading me an article that claimed that throughout history, revolutions were led by second children. <laughs> Dissatisfied with the status quo that worked so well for their older siblings. John was one of those revolutionary spirits. He wasn't afraid to take on the orthodoxies of the day or of the family. He went to Brown, not Harvard. He loved Ronald Reagan and interviewed Fidel Castro. He preferred to start a business rather than run for office. And he worked hard for people that others ignored. He founded Reaching Up to help caregivers of the disabled. And he was always interested in juvenile justice. Underneath John's generosity of spirit and sense of mischief, was also a deep pride in our father's legacy and a faith in the wisdom of the American people. He believed that George was a means to reach and interest people in the issues of the day, and that the more Americans were informed and engaged, and the more they participated in politics, the better off America would be. It was a mission that George shared with the Institute of Politics, and the reason why it is so appropriate that this discussion take place here tonight. John believed in the Institute as a living memorial to President Kennedy, as well as in its role as an incubator of ideas and inspiration for the next generation of leaders. He appreciated the give and take that he found with the students and the fellows here, 
and brought the spirit of those exchanges back to the magazine, even as he used George to expand the roster of speakers that visited the forum. He understood the importance of reaching beyond Harvard to make politics more accessible, and that serious purpose was the foundation for the entertainment that George provided, and his success in expanding the audience for politics brought John the greatest satisfaction. Many of the people here helped John re-energize the IOP during his service on the Senior Advisory Committee and worked hard to create this forum, especially Heather Campion and Kathy McLaughlin. And many others were part of his team at George, and they've come from far and wide to be here tonight, including some of our panelists, and we are grateful to all of them for being here. But only one person here was chosen by John to imagine himself as president, though many of us may have wished he would consider it since he retired from his distinguished career as America's preeminent anchorman. In the May, June 90, 1996 issue of George, Tom Brokaw wrote the If I Were President column. And I quote, my major objective would be to restore a sense of common purpose to this deeply divided land. Instead of trying to appease myriad separate and narrow interests, I'd summon warring parties to the White House and say, stop whining and work this out here and now. We hope that is exactly what he will do tonight and on behalf of my family and all of us who love John, I want to thank him for bring, being here tonight to moderate this discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much, Senator Kennedy. Caroline, um, Caroline, I don't know whether it occurred to you, but as I was watching you introduce me, I thought about that day about 25 years ago when I came to Harvard to speak, and you were an undergraduate, and with one of your cousins, you gave me a 90-second tour of Cambridge at 65 miles an hour <laughs> in your Beamer. I could see us in the police blotter before the day was over, and it worked out that well. Uh, I am always thrilled to be part of any proceedings here at the Kennedy School of Government, particularly at the Institute of Politics, but I always feel like I'm coming through the back door because when I was a young man out on the Great Plains, there was a Harvard alum who thought that I might be a candidate for admission to Harvard. His enthusiasm was not shared by the admissions office at Harvard. <laughs> and so I've been left to wonder all these years what success I might have had in life if I'd been a Harvard graduate. I accepted Caroline's invitation to appear here tonight with great enthusiasm, personally and professionally. Personally because I so admired John Kennedy as a, not just as a popular icon of his generation, but as a young man committed, really, to the fabric of what makes up this great country of ours. At any given time, our political system is a reflection of all of us, our strengths and our weaknesses, what we want to leave behind, what we stand for at that time in history, and it is how we will be measured. And John, who could have done anything that he wanted to do, wanted to force this country to look at politics in new and refreshing ways. He did that with great intelligence, his always ready wit, and with a passion that he was willing to commit his reputation and himself to this very public undertaking and do it in a way that would provoke us to get involved once again in politics, to find that intersection between the political structure of America and the popular culture that attracts us all. We're going to talk about that some here tonight. We have um, in Chappaqua, New York, and we'll be going to him shortly, former President Clinton is with us, and we'll be going to New York, uh, to California as well after New York. We'll be going to California to hear from another member of the Kennedy family, although he doesn't quite see it that way. <laughs> the governor of the state of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And to get our discussion going, we really have a very lively and distinguished panel. Uh, Roger Ailes, who is sitting immediately to my left, 
is in our business and in American media a true legend. At the age of 25, he was the executive producer of The Mike Douglas Show. It was there that he met Richard Nixon and became involved in his campaigns. He went on to be an important consultant to three Republican presidents, President Bush 41, Ronald Reagan, and of course, Richard Nixon. He has worked for all the networks with great distinction and with great success. And his most enduring legacy, I believe, will be the invention of the Fox News Channel. He has reinvented cable news in America. Roger has succeeded at everything that he has ever undertaken except the South Beach diet, but we're very happy to have him here with us tonight. <laughs> Shamu Green is uh, the son, uh, the daughter of, of, of Liberian uh, exiles who came here and enrolled in graduate school. And as we were talking earlier, she is the embodiment of the American dream and what makes this country so great. She is, as you know, the president of Rock the Vote. Before that, she worked in the Clinton campaign, and she was also the Southern representative for the Democratic National Committee, and politics, as it's practiced in this country, has become a great passion of her. She's also a frequent commentator in uh, the print and on television as well. Paul Begala, a political consultant and commentator who rode out of Texas and rode to glory with James Car Carville when they worked on the campaign of Bill Clinton. He is exceptionally well known, of course, for his commentary on Crossfire and other television programs and for his books, including Is Our Children Learning? The Case Against George Bush. <laughs> Paul Begala, however, may be the only member of this audience who does not have his TiVo set to Jon Stewart and The Daily Show. <laughs> Roger, let me uh, begin with you. One of the notions that John Kennedy Jr. had was that there is this intersection between politics and culture, and they interact in ways that we don't always acknowledge. Has the right side of the political spectrum in this country invented a popular culture to support its ideology, or did the culture of the left just create an opening for the right? I don't know. I, I, I do know that, uh, that John, John and I were having some dialogues about marketing and reaching younger viewers. Uh, I was impressed with his sense of humor and his belief that we don't have to hate each other, that we can have different points of view, that we can have some laughs, that we can do it in a kind of humorous way. And it reminded me of, a lot of people say entertainment's crept into the news. We get accused of that in the news business. The news actually crept into entertainment. Back when Walter Cronkite started, I believe they were running around CBS saying, is there enough news in the world to fill 15 minutes? Because remember those days? That was really a true story. <clears throat> now they've got 24-hour news channels and so on. Is there enough news in the world to fill 15 minutes? Because people were involved in all sorts of other things. I remember, because I knew him quite well, in fact, managed him at one time in my career, Mort Sol, who was one of the great comedians who uh, really came into his own in the 50s and then the 60s and so on and went on. Great political comedian. And I produced a show called The Mike Douglas Show, which Mike was a nightclub singer and basically um, you know, interviewed people but had mostly people from show business. We began to introduce a serious segment in that show in the 1960s. I was 25 years old producing this national television show, and we did a week of, of uh, political people as co-hosts. And I remember having Hubert Humphrey, uh, his, his wife was on, and then Hubert Humphrey came in and we filmed in his home in Minnesota and so on. This was in a show that um, was basically um, an entertainment program, comedians and singers and so on. And we would do that core segment in the 60s. Martin Luther King was a guest on that show three times that I know of. Um, and uh, 
actually the senator's mom was on the Mike Douglas show, because I have a picture with her probably in 1966, 67, sitting with Mike Douglas. So the, even back then, uh, this was beginning to change. John recognized it, uh, appreciated it, had fun with it, enjoyed it, and created a product but have you, taken it to, have you taken it to new and different levels, both at Fox and how you market and program Bill O'Reilly and Hannity and Combs, and has, you were also a consultant to Rush when he was on television, you've been very close to him. Has that taken the popular culture into the political arena in a new way that is an advantage to those people who were right of center and didn't feel that they had a culture of their own before? I don't think so. I think it evened up in talk radio to some, some degree. Uh, there's two kinds of news on the cable channels. Paul Begala was on an opinion program, basically. He did a left opinion, and Crossfire had a left and a right from the beginning. Hannity and Combs, we just decided that we would do the same show they did at CNN, except not have the people hate each other. <laughs> uh, you didn't have Novak. <laughs> <laughs> Novak didn't hate you. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but anyway, you know, Hannity and Combs don't hate each other. That was really the only difference. As I said, we're going to get two people who have different views who don't hate each other. Um, and, and so that, we have opinion shows. O'Reilly is clearly an opinion show. But Shep Smith does the evening news at 7 o'clock. I don't know what his politics are. I mean, I, I think I could guess but I can't see it in the, in the news. They're certainly not to the right. Uh, that newscast is, is as pure as you can get, as far as the way you did. I mean, so uh, filling up cable news, you have opinion, that's all. And, and some shows are labeled and some shows aren't. We're going to go to President Clinton in Chappaqua because we have the satellite ready there and the meter is running. And we don't want him to have to put extra quarters in the machine down in Chappaqua <laughs> to get him up. So, President Clinton, I hope that you can hear me. We have a large screen here in the auditorium, and uh, there you are, sir. If you've been listening to this discussion, I've been pressing Roger a little bit about whether <clears throat> those on the right of center in American politics have created a new popular culture that helps reinforce their message and that it has been successful, or did they just take advantage of the opening that the left may have given them with their popular culture, which seem to exclude the sensibilities and the values of a lot of people? Well, Tom, I think the answer is a little bit of both. And I'd like to explain why. But first, let me uh, thank you for being there. And uh, thank you, Caroline, Ted, and Vicki, and uh, all the people at the Kennedy School. Uh, let me make a general point about John Kennedy and George first. I liked him and I like George. And I don't think that he saw politics and culture as necessary to both either the left or the right. I think what he saw is that people don't divide their lives into I'm a politician when I vote, then I'm interested in culture, and then here are all these real things I'm interested in. I think that in 92, when I went on the Arsenio Hall show, which I know uh, he took a great interest in or uh, was in MTV's Rock the Vote campaign, in 96, when the internet began to dominate uh, our politics, and by 2000, a lot of young people were actually getting their news off the John Stewart show. I think a lot of this is the blurring of lines of politics and culture uh, across left and right. Now, the specific answer to your question, it seems to me, is this. I think that there was a reaction conservative culture, which you see in, to some extent in Bill O'Reilly or Rush Limbaugh, are Ann Coulter's books where it, I think they set up kind of straw men, which are extreme versions of what people haven't liked about liberals since the 1960s, and then shoot them down and sort of build on resentment. But in addition to that, there's an affirmative conservative culture that, uh, like liberal culture, is communitarian. And you see that in these big mega churches uh, that are all embracing in the suburban areas of around cities in North Carolina, for example, where you have thousands of members of churches in suburban Chicago and elsewhere, where you have preschool programs, you have choirs, you have single programs, you have programs for alcohol and drug abuse, you have programs to keep marriages together, a whole bubble culture, and but it's very communitarian, and so they come forward to 
fight AIDS or fight poverty in Africa or help people in emergencies like Katrina. The only difference in that and kind of the positive progressive communitarian culture is that it's also somewhat exclusive. That is, you have to believe certain things and if you don't, you're not part of that. But I do think it's still a, a kind of communitarianism and that I think has been created. You know, it's that exclusivity that worries me a little bit, that we have these litmus tests in both parties now, and unless you meet all the litmus tests, you're not welcome in many ways. And yet, we see the heroic work that you and former President Bush are doing, first with tsunami relief and now in the Gulf Coastal region. Do you think that in some ways that you're in the forefront of a turn in this country in which people are gonna wanna work together outside of their ideological lines for common solutions to these overarching common problems that we have? Well, I hope so. We've seen it periodically in the past, but I think after the Cold War was over, there was a period of time when a lot of people thought there were no consequences to extreme ideological partisanship, but there are serious consequences. Uh, our country, I think, is around here after over 200 years because we've had two broad-based parties, one generally to the right of center, one generally to the left of center. They actually changed places after Theodore Roosevelt left the White House. The Republican Party was the Liberal Party from Abraham Lincoln through Theodore Roosevelt. And then we changed part places for the last 100 years or so. But we also had room for conservatives in the Democratic Party and liberals in the Republican Party. It was not as emotionally satisfying, perhaps it's not as intellectually satisfying, but enabled us to work together to find common ground. And uh, that's normally how things are done in a democracy, in the, in the messy but progressive middle. It seems to me that one of the most important figures in American, for that matter, in the global arena today is Bono, uh, a great artist, but he is a man who is moving the tectonic plates of consciousness around the world. And he too may be the harbinger of change that will come. I don't think there's any question about that. I think they're, they're basically since the end of the Cold War, three things have changed the face of politics. Um, for the first time in history, more than a majority of the world's people live under governments they voted in. And even in China, there are mayor's elections in 900,000 villages. Secondly, the internet is a political as well as an information tool. In the last election, you know this, for the first time since the advent of expensive television ads, both parties in the aggregate raise more money from small contributions and large ones because of the internet. When the tsunami hit South Asia, uh, about a third of American households made contributions, over half of them over the internet. We don't know what the numbers are in Katrina yet, but they're very high. Uh, and the third thing is the rise of the non-governmental organization, the, the people who don't run for office but organize to solve problems. That's what my foundation does, that's what Bill Gates does, and Bono be, was able to bridge the partisan divide partly because he's got a deaf touch and he's a profoundly intelligent and good human being, but also because when he goes to see Jesse Helms about AIDS or debt relief, uh, he doesn't bring any partisan baggage and he's not running for office. So people are free to hear him. And I think uh, Bill Gates has the same influence on education and health care. And of course, now that I can't run for anything anymore, I actually get some Republicans to help me from time to time and we work together. <laughs> so I, I'd like to see that happen in the political arena more. You know, when, it's funny, because when I was a governor, every year I ran for office, my vote went up among Republicans. I didn't know that I was some sort of space alien until I went to Washington and learned that people think differently there. That it's, and I think partly it's because there are, people are too divorced from the, from the daily lives of people in Washington. You get, there are too many intermediaries kind of painting pictures for you in the public. Mr. President, it, it always uh, troubles me to say to a former president of the United States, I'm slightly older than you are, but we come out essentially uh, the same generation in terms of our interests and when we came of age. Uh, uh, we were both children, in effect, of the new frontier. And we grew up at a time in America, wherever we lived, whether it was in Arkansas or in the Great Plains, when there was a real excitement when you were in high school and in college about the public arena and wanting to become a part of it and paying attention to it on a daily basis. I even had a roommate who had all 50 senators' pictures on the wall of our common house, uh, like later generations would have Playboy posters. 
Why I didn't come along later, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, it worked out very well. Do you think if you were a young man at Georgetown now, that you would be drawn in the same way to the idea of a public life as you were when you came from Arkansas to Washington, D.C., and then on to New Haven? I do. I wouldn't trade my life for anything, and I, I still believe in it. But I think that uh, we have to work at it because there's been so much poison in the well and so much of a <clears throat> kind of a demonization and destruction element in politics in the last several years in which neither the politicians nor the political press nor any of the major actors are blameless. But yes, I do. I also think, however, there will be more and more people interested in being active as political citizens who don't necessarily run for office, the same way John Kennedy was when he started George. Uh, that's Bono. Uh, you see it uh, in lots of other people in other walks of life who are now devoting themselves to solving problems and to working with politicians where necessary and alone where they can. I, I just, I think you're going to see more of a blurring of the political and civic and personal and cultural in a way that is, I think, quite positive for our ability to meet our common challenges. Mr. President, I may have stepped down from Nightly News, but I haven't lost my credentials entirely. I would be remiss if I didn't say something to the effect. Are you getting up in the morning and practicing saying, Madam President, can I get you a cup of coffee? <laughs> No, you know what I do? This is, ironically, you'd be asking this, this is my 30th wedding anniversary. And when I get off of this program, uh, I'm taking my wife to dinner and maybe to a movie, uh, even though Commander-in-Chief is on television tonight. <laughs> what I'm getting up every morning and saying is, we got an election next year and don't look past it. Uh, you never look past the next election or you may not get past the next election. I, you know, if she ever did that and she won, she'd be fabulous. I have no idea if she'll run. I have no idea if she would win if she did. But I've never known anybody I thought did a better job and brought more ability to public life. So whatever she wants to do, I'm for. We did it my way for about 27 years, and I were about near as I can calculate about 25 more years to catch up. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Jamil, you work a lot with young people. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis in this past election cycle about get out the vote. P. Diddy and others were out there saying vote or die. Um, <laughs> it didn't quite work out the way John Kerry and the Democrats had hoped that it would. Do you think that John Kennedy with George was A, a little bit ahead of his time, and B, what has to be done unconventionally in both parties to pull the mass of young people back into politics, Republican or Democrat? Well, I would start by saying that I think in the 2004 election, we saw the mass of young people come back into the political process, and that is because of the work that all of the young people out there, the activists, the people who were knocking on doors, registering their friends, organizing voter registration drives, they really did bring this generation back into this process. I think that John Kennedy was absolutely ahead of his time and, and responsible in a number of ways with George Magazine for helping to bridge that gap for this generation with the political process. We, you know, as young people, don't necessarily or didn't necessarily have that excitement that you talked about when you were in high school and you know, everyone in your high school was engaged and interested in what was going on in politics. Civic education has decreased tremendously in this country. Uh, the amount of media messages and other influences on this generation's life is, is so tremendous that to have politics break through in a significant and substantive way in the 2004 election, it really did happen because of the 10 years um, you know, from 1992, starting with President Clinton, starting with the work that Rock the Vote did, having celebrities, and not just celebrities, but um, you know, with Rock the Vote, we tried to surround young people. If they walked into a Virgin Records store, if they walked in 
to a DKNY store, if they walked into a 7-Eleven, they would get a message about voting. So surrounding their entire culture with it. And a lot of the lessons that we learned did come out of, you know, I think what George Magazine did. And the unfortunate thing is, though, because this generation was successful um, in really getting engaged and I think turning out so many of their peers in the 2004 election, when the media didn't give them the credit and didn't give them um, you know, their props, basically, for the historic turnout that we saw in November of 2004, um, unfortunately, we have the opportunity where young people may feel like their efforts weren't um, as uh, impactful as we know that they were. But if we can continue to, I think, combine um, kind of that surround sound effort, if we can continue to um, not just make politics something that's about what's happening inside of the Beltway, it's about you know, exactly what George Magazine was talking about. It's like the style of politics, the comedy behind it, the everything that you see on the Daily Show every single night, that's what engages this generation and makes them feel like it's a part of their life. And um, so George Magazine, I think, had a big part to do with the excitement we saw in the 2004 election because they, with MTV, with Rock the Vote, really kicked this effort off and with President Clinton. Paul Begala, one of the advantages of being slightly on the outside now and looking back in from the position that I now have is that it reinforces my belief that the political arena has become too much of a closed shop. It's kind of partisan ink on both sides. And that then is reinforced by the mechanics of voting in this country which closely resemble the public transportation system in a third world nation. I mean, it is, it's uneven, it's inefficient, uh, it's not reliable. I don't know a lot of people who have much faith in it. Is it time for a kind of bipartisan crusade, a coming together in the way that President Clinton and, and President Bush have come together, the way Bob Dole and, and George McGovern have come together on some issues, to address these fundamental underlying issues that are driving us apart? Well, some of the mechanical issues were addressed by a bipartisan commission. President Carter and Jim Baker, President Bush's. Did they go uh, far Secretary enough in your State. judgment? I don't know enough about it to tell you the truth. They, they must have because at least some of my folks on the left were, as President Clinton would say, squealing like a pig stuck under a gate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and despite the fact that President Carter blessed some of these reforms, there were some, I think, that progressives didn't like at all. Uh, I do think the mechanics need some work. But political players are just going to react. Uh, they, they're not rule makers. They're game players. Uh, and I think it's useful for people in settings like this to try to think about those rules. What do we need to do? I mean, we did motor voter, and we've done a lot of things. Uh, so I'm not, there are, and there were in some states, real mechanical disparities between different areas. Um, but that's the system that we have. I think it's useful for people to take a look at that. They did after 2000. Not very much was done. Maybe a little bit more will be done now. But fundamentally, I think we've got to do what Jim was talking about. We've got to make it more interesting, uh, more fun. Um, you know, in another forum, Roger and I are going to have a, a debate about the content on Fox, but the style has it right. It's fun. They have fun there. I actually talked to somebody who worked there and said, uh, gee, what's it like? She said, we have fun, by God. And you know, sometimes CNN, I have fun, sometimes I don't. Uh, you know, and I think the audience gets that. I think that they, that, and, and with politicians, I mean, you know, I, golly, spent 11 months traveling around the country with Bill Clinton. We had fun. You know, and it was the first time since President Kennedy ran that turnout went up, and it particularly went up under young people, uh, for young people. And so I think some of it is, is just trying to reach people where they live, uh, taking it out of that hothouse, uh, and trying to make it relevant, fun, exciting, interesting. That is what I think John was trying to do with George, and I think it's what successful politicians try to do with their campaigns. What did you think when John Stewart took you to task on your own program <laughs> for not raising the level of public discourse in this country. I yeah, guess I, that would be a fair summary of what he was saying. You know, Crossfire at the time had been on the air for 23 years, and he just realized that we yell at each other. I kind of wondered, did he pay full price for tuition? I mean, what did he think? Um, his beef seemed to be that we, you know, after this show, it was a ridiculous show. All I was doing was looking at my watch and thinking about how I'd get home. Seriously, Tucker Carlson behaved like an ass. John behaved like an ass. Um, they did. I'm sorry, they embarrassed themselves. John Stewart began by saying we lower the level of discourse, and he finished by calling Tucker Carlson a, a vulgar name for a part of a man's body. Okay, now that's kind of defeating your own purpose. But afterwards, he stayed around, and he and I and our producers, Ben Carlin, his, and Sam Feist, who produced Crossfire, had a really interesting 90-minute conversation. Tucker stormed out. He was angry. But we had a really interesting, I wish the cameras had been on for that. And essentially his concern, I, I 
I haven't talked about this in public, but his concern seemed to be that uh, by putting on supposedly both sides and partisans of both sides, uh, you're not really getting at the truth. And he believes, you know, like a sophomore in philosophy class, that there is objective platonic truth out there. And we should just have one person, just the expert, say from the Kennedy School, and explain Social Security, because there is truth out there. And he and I just disagree. I think it's much better to fight it out, to have, uh, you know, Senator Kennedy debate Senator Hatch, and then we'll just let people figure it out for themselves. I guess I trust people more to sort it all out. Paul, we're going to go to California now. Uh, if you'd talked on, you would have had to deal with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I'd rather not see that. It could be really ugly, actually. Um, and the governor of California joins us now by satellite. Uh, governor, welcome. You're in Los Angeles, I gather, g given the backdrop there. Well, thank you. This is, it's terrific out here, and it is uh, great to talk to you, Tom, and to be part of this program, not just politics as usual. That's terrific. Well, I don't think this, you know, part of the, uh, part of the theme here, uh, Governor, is that we're talking about the intersection of politics and the popular culture. You're the apotheosis of that in many ways. Um, when you ran uh, for governor of California, I think it's fair to say that uh, your uh, very distinguished and very popular film career was probably an asset of some kind, to say nothing of Caroline's cousin Maria. I have to put that in as well or I don't get out of here alive tonight. Um, but now that you have been governing and in difficult circumstances, we all know, um, tell me uh, about the techniques that you learned, not just as an actor, but as someone who knew how to sell Arnold the movie star and how they come into play when you're dealing in the political arena. Well, first of all, I was very fortunate, Tom, that when I was in school, in Austria, I went through a vocational education where I learned how to be a salesman. So I always learned how to sell anything. If it is bodybuilding, or if it is my movies, or if it is policies, or to sell myself as I could be the next governor of California. So that was always you know, something, a strength that I had. But I think coming from a, the entertainment background, I think it was definitely helpful because people were more interested in watching that campaign and as you could see, even just the way we announced the candidacy on the Tonight Show, all of that was different. Our whole campaign was different. The approach was different because it was always the idea to bring more people in and to make more people participate in the political process. And I think because of that, we had record turnouts uh, during the election, uh, which was really terrific to get more people involved. But now you're bumping up against some very well-organized interests in California, uh, representing really a wide spectrum in that state. Uh, once the excitement of the election is over and the campaign is over, is it more difficult to use those same techniques to go against, say, the nurses in California or some of the uh, public service employees who are not happy with what you have in mind? Well, first of all, Tom, I don't have to go against the nurses. I'm with the nurses. And I'm also with the firefighters and with all the other hardworking people. I'm against government employee union uh, bosses. I'm against the bosses that are trying to run the state of California. And I think that the rule is basically the same as it was two years ago, which is that I have to go directly to the people of California. Because I can see that the legislators are a lot of times in the pockets of the big government employee union bosses. And therefore, I have to go to the people. And that's what I've done during my recall election. I go out directly to the people. The people have been my partners, and I think that the people will be my partners in this election also. I don't care about all the fights and all the attacks that the, that the unions are doing on me. I mean, I go directly to the people, and I think on November 8th will be Judgment Day where the people again will vote for true reform in California. I have the people as my true partners in this. And you'll say I'll be back on November 8th, I presume? <laughs> Trust me, Tom, I will be saying I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Governor, um, I know when you first took office out there, uh, one of your adversaries, but really one of your allies, was John Burton, who was in the state senate in California at the time. He comes from a long, uh, distinguished Democratic family in California. Uh, you had differences about how uh, the state should be organized. But nonetheless, he would come into your office and you would work things out. He was then sent out of office by term limits. And now that you're governor, 
and you look around at people like John Burton who are no longer there or people who have served for some length of time who have had to go back to their hometowns because of term limits, do you think it's a good idea to have term limits or not? Well, I think that uh, people trying to do anything and everything that they can to change politics as usual and to change the way things are in, in Sacramento or in Washington. So, so I think it's their way of expressing to say, look, I think that in order to change the system, we maybe should put term limits on it. Not that I say, you know, every one of those things has disadvantages and advantages, and it's an endless debate, should we have term limits or not? I think it is a good idea to have term limits, but there are some people that are very qualified, like a John Burton that you're talking about. There was a terrific leader, and he was an honest man, and that it could work with them uh, and with him specifically. And we could really go and uh, come up with bipartisan solutions to the problems. No, so I had really a terrific time working with him. And he was very helpful in my first year in my administration. You are a Republican. What kind of pressure do you get from the National Party or even from California Republicans because of your positions, say, on choice or on stem cell research? Are they saying, come on, Governor, you've got to get over here on this side of the line with the rest of us? Well, I think that uh, you have talked about this just earlier with President Clinton. I think it is uh, much better if we make decisions based on what is best for the people of California or the best of the, for the people of America and not worry about what is a Republican idea and what is a Democratic idea. I mean, when you think about stem cell research, this is something that will help Democrats and Republicans. Why someone draws the line in the sand on this issue, I have no idea why that is. And there's many other issues, if it has to do with the environment or if it has to do with business decisions or you know, taking, uh, getting rid of some of the regulations of businesses in order to make our economy stimulated and make our uh, businesses boom again and create more jobs and all this. All of this stuff has nothing to do with politics. It's supposed to be just what is best for the people. And the same is, you know, when you think about the traffic, one of the main complaints that we have right now here in California is that people are stuck in traffic. We have so many cars, we have an increase in population of 500,000 people every year, and we as the government do not build enough uh, you know, tra infrastructure in transportation. That's an issue. People, Democrats and Republicans, are getting stuck in traffic. So, I mean, that's an issue that is, ought to be addressed in a different way, like what is best for the people of California? What is best for the people rather than what's best for our party or what's best for our special interest groups that are supporting us, what's best for the labor unions, what's best for the business, corporate American orders. I don't think we should make decisions based on that. Always in the end it is what's best for the people. Governor, finally, um, as you know, a member of your extended family is here, Senator Kennedy. Uh -oh. Is there any message that <laughs> have we, we lost the earpiece? Thank you. Thank you. We got it right here, Tom. Okay. I, I was worried for a moment there when, as soon as I mentioned Senator Kennedy's name, you took your earpiece out. Uh, I, I, is there any message that you want me to convey to Senator Kennedy about starting the proceedings for a constitutional convention for an amendment that will allow foreign-born citizens to run for President of the United States? Is there any message that you'd like me to deliver to him on that regard? No. As a matter of fact, I have plenty of time, uh, time to talk to uh, uh, Senator Kennedy, uh, he has been very helpful, as a matter of fact, ever since I got elected. I always can go to him for advice, and he always has tremendous wisdom. And uh, I always enjoy talking to him about policy, if it is about uh, uh, the latest uh, conversations we had, is with, about the guest workers program for undocumented immigrants here in America and all this. So I enjoy all, in, all this conversation because he has been in there in, this, uh, in politics for so many years and he has so much knowledge about it and he's very smart about it, so I love always getting advice from him. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not concentrating about changing the constitutional amendment. I'm only concentrating right now on one thing, and this is to create real reform in California and to make the people vote yes on Proposition 74, 75, 76, and 77. So this is going to be the bottom line. Winning, creating good reform, and then moving the state forward rather than backwards. Uh, Governor, thank you very much. I know the traffic conditions out in uh, California at about this time, so you have to get started if you're going to get home in time to help Maria get dinner ready for the kids. So thank you very much for being here with us. Today. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Now, I have a moment of full disclosure I want to share with you. I knew Arnold before he was Arnold. I lived down in Venice Beach in California, and there was a coffee shop that I would stop in in the morning on the way to work, and Arnold would be in there getting his power shake and quickly would ask me about California politics and the national scene. He went on to become Arnold Schwarzenegger, obviously, and I also knew Maria from the time that she was working on her father's campaign. And so serendipitously one night we were all in New York together and there was Arnold and I was talking to him and I walked away and Maria said, do you know him? And I said, yes. She said, kid, I'm dying to meet him. I introduced him and it went on from there. So this past, <laughs> this past, uh, this past February I said uh, at a dinner at which we were all there, I said that I knew them before they knew each other. Then I knew them as boyfriend and girlfriend. Then I knew them as fiancés. I knew them as bride and groom, husband and wife, mother and father, now governor and first lady of California. And I always like to think that I can get ahead of the curve, so I'd like to raise a glass to Madam President and first husband Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Maria's side of the family liked that a lot. I'm not so sure that the governor did. Um, we want to go to the audience for questions here in the time that we have left. We've got about 20 minutes left before we uh, get to uh, Senator Kennedy, who was described as the patron saint of Massachusetts politics, emphasis on both parts of that description. Um, but before we do, I just want to quickly ask Roger and Chenu and Paul whether they think we're at a moment in history in the political arena when there is about to be a sea change, I don't mean in terms of the balance of power in Congress or in the White House, but that the country is beginning to say, stop, we can't continue the culture of blame that seems to have affected our politics. We saw it firsthand in the Gulf Coast from the bottom up and the top down, both parties. And is there, a, is there a chance that the country will kind of rise up and say, quit playing these deeply ideological partisan games left to right and back again? Paul? No. No, I think we're going the other way. Um, I, I think there's a couple of causes. I, I, Democrats who tend toward the center like President Clinton, Republicans who tend toward the center like Governor Schwarzenegger are more the exception than the rule. Uh, we're going through a great sorting out among the parties. President Clinton talked about how there used to be a lot more conservative Democrats, used to be more liberal Republicans. Uh, some of it is regional. You know, I grew up in Missouri City, Texas. The whole state's congressional delegation was Democratic until a guy named George Bush got elected to the House from Houston. Now the majority of my state's congressmen are Republicans. Vice versa up here. You know, when I was born in Massachusetts, it was th these were bastions of Republican uh, strength in the Northeast. Uh, the, the president's grandfather was a senator from Connecticut, which now has two Democratic senators. So some of it is regional, but some of it is ideological. Uh, another cause is uh, gerrymandering of House districts, where there's sort of an unholy alliance between the parties, where we herd all the Democrats in to enormously Democratic districts and all the Republicans into really enormously Republican districts. So if you grew up where I did today, you're either in Tom DeLay's district or next door uh, in, in a very, very... Uh, liberal African-American congresswoman's district. Uh, there's nothing in between. There's, the moderates are getting wiped out from both parties, and it's, it's both parties' fault. And I think media plays a role in that as well. Uh, we want to heighten the conflict. We want the tension. You know, some of that is to the good. I like fights. I like uh, principled, partisan disagreements. Uh, and I think it's good to sort things out that way. Uh, I think it'd be an awfully boring country if all we did was have vigorous agreements. Uh, but at some point, we do have to come together and get things done. And I was uh, uh, disappointed after Katrina, the story in the New York Times today. It essentially says uh, conservatives want to simply use uh, Katrina to try out uh, tried and true conservative beliefs, uh, cutting back on affirmative action, cutting back on the prevailing wage, cutting back on environmental controls. Uh, liberals want to protect and preserve the 60s era welfare state. And I didn't see anything in the middle with any energy. Shmoo Green, your parents came here from Africa, political exiles. They came here because of a promise of democracy and the rule of law. This is the epitome of democratic principles around the world. Are they disappointed in what they see here? And as an extension of them, 
Do you think that we're about to go to a new plane in American politics? Do you think it's important that we try to? I, I definitely don't think my parents are disappointed. I think they, having become citizens actually three years ago, are absolutely just thrilled to be able to participate and be able to have a voice and organize their blocks and get involved in these different activities. I rarely ever disagree with who I think is the patron saint of democratic politics in Texas, because I rode out of Texas as well. But I'm going to have to say that I disagree with Paul, because I do think that we are facing a point where people are becoming, because of the move-ons, because of blogs, because of the internet, becoming more smart and able to actually access politics. And they're not going to continue to allow things just to kind of stay the same way. And seeing the reaction to Hurricane Katrina, seeing the ability of you know, people at MoveOn were able to raise $2 million for a small group of state representatives out of Texas because of redistricting. That type of power, that type of organ organizing is going to really, like, I think, create a segment of the population that says, we do have the tools, we do have the access, we don't like what they're doing in DC inside the Beltway, and we're going to use these tools to, make, to actually make a difference. And that's what I think excites my parents. They are excited by the fact that they can actually log on and have their voice heard. And um, if we can continue to grow that part of the population, I think that's how the sea change will happen. Roger, you've always been expert at reading the seismographs in this country when the plates are moving. What's your take on the short-term future of the American political arena? <clears throat> I actually think the sea change is taking place globally, and it will affect politics in this country. I think we are on a short-term course of more divisiveness, but in the end, uh, we're all Americans. And as Western culture declines, and other cultures, particularly ones who want to dominate us, uh, get stronger, Americans will begin to pull together because they're not going to have any choice. In the end, we don't want to live in Somalia. We don't want to live in some of these countries that have these problems. In the end, there are hundreds of thousands of women in Afghanistan and Iraq today who are voting and doing things that they would never have been allowed to do for a thousand years because democracy is moving forward at a slow and very difficult rate. Young people today, the internet being global, the, the use of the internet, the, the fear is that young people will begin to not think there's a right or wrong, or not think there's a real way or a not a real way. They'll depend on Wikipedia instead of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, they'll have to sort that out. But in the end, the future depends on men are relatively reactionary and stupid. Women and young people will probably make the difference in pulling America back together again and making us a great nation. Right on. <laughs> Okay, young people, you have your assignment. Report back here tomorrow. <laughs> Put the country back together. Question from the audience, please, if we can. Hello, I'm Raul Prabhakar. I'm a freshman at Harvard College. And this question is general to the panel. And it raises a, it extends Mr. Brokaw's question, which Mr. Schwarzenegger didn't answer, um, which is, do you believe immigrants to America, like me, who have become full-fledged citizens, um, should they be allowed to run for president? I'd have a compromise. I would, I would, I would, Senator Kennedy, I'd have you and your colleagues sponsor an amendment that would allow Governor Schwarzenegger and other uh, non-native born Americans uh, to end that discrimination in our Constitution against them, and at the same time repeal the 22nd Amendment so we could reelect President Clinton or President Bush if we wanted to do that. Those are two uh, restrictions on the presidency that I think do, do not serve the country well. So why don't we repeal them both and have at it. Let Schwarzenegger run against Clinton. It might be an interesting race. <laughs> You don't think he'd welcome that, do you? <laughs> as long as it's not. What do you think, Roger? Do you think that we'll do you think we'll ever get a constitutional amendment that will allow foreign-born in our lifetime, yours and mine, well, which could be another weeks. thirty minutes? I I remember you down at the beach too with this. <laughs> <laughs> He wanted to be Arnold, but it just didn't work out. He had a better voice, not the body, he had the voice. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that someday, but not in our lifetime. I think that everything's evolutionary. I, you know, I have a different view of, you know, immigration than most. I think we we keep talking about the quantity of the number of immigrants coming here. That's never the issue. We have plenty of room. We could double the number of immigrants. It's quality. It's people who come here to want to be Americans, who believe in our system, who want to live by the laws and the rules and, and salute the flag and say what a great country this is and freedom's wonderful and we, let's try to bring it to everybody. So it's an issue, in my view, that as more and more immigrants come, and they should, but they should come through a door so we know who they are. We, they should come through. We should allow them in. We should try to help them. We should, you know, we have, we don't require English in this country. Nine countries require English, some of them who have sworn to kill us. So when you call to get your American Express balance, you have to talk to a guy in Bangkok. You should be talking to a guy in Philadelphia or Newark or Waco or someplace else. Uh, you, you can't outsource both the manufacturing jobs and the service jobs. So this is a great country. We ought to welcome all the immigrants. And eventually they will become able to run, I think, for, for any office in the land. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Alex. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, as Governor Schwarzenegger shows, um, celebrities from the pop culture arena can have a great deal of influence on politics. But uh, during the last election, when celebrities like Bruce Springsteen went out on the campaign trail, people seemed to see it as an intrusion. Um, what's the right balance to strike? Uh, did George strike it? And is anyone out there uh, even close to striking it again? Thanks. Paul, why don't you take a crack at that? Well, yeah, John got a ton of static. You know, the very first issue of George, he had Cindy Crawford with her bare midriff dressed up as George Washington. He got a lot of grief for that. Um, but it worked. Uh, it drew people in. People liked it. Uh, I never thought the problem with the Democrats was that they had too many Hollywood people around them. I mean, President Clinton certainly liked running with that whole crowd. It didn't hurt him. Uh, you know, he won two elections pretty handily. Um, I, th I think the problem becomes uh, not so much the celebrities as it becomes, at least in my party, a sense that middle class people get very often, and correctly very often, that we're elitist. It's not just running around with Bruce Springsteen. It's not living by the values that Bruce Springsteen sings in his songs. I think that's the political problem that the Democrats have. Frank Sinatra had a great line, nobody ever paid to hear me talk. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think Bruce Springsteen broke the rules. Young people don't want to be told what to do. If you want to show up and perform at a politician's uh, event, that sort of says, okay, I'm for this guy. Don't tell him how to vote. Don't change your lyrics and tell him how to vote, because young people want to make up their own minds. Jamu, what about the staying power of young people? You talked about the, the number of people who voted the last time around. Uh, will they be around for the next cycle, do you think? Is this something that took with them? Is it now systemic in their lives, or was it uh, a kind of passing fancy? Well, I hope it's not a passing fantasy. I think that there is work that has to be done to make sure that we can continue those levels of engagement. And, you know, we've seen already from the Republican National Committee their interest in making sure that they don't lose the youth vote the next time around. I've heard Ken Melman make, you know, really positive statements about the outreach that they're going to do. Obviously, the administration has said that their whole Social Security campaign is targeted towards this generation. So. The more that we can keep this generation engaged in between election cycles, the more that they will stay engaged. And I, I think we have seen a lot of really positive um, movement on the right. Um, now, on the left, the Democrats have to figure out how they keep that 60% that supported Kerry and how they keep them engaged, because that message did come out that young people didn't vote, that they didn't turn out in large numbers, and now we have to fight back and make sure that they know the real the real deal, what happened. They turned out in historic numbers. They had the biggest impact on the election, the highest increase in turnout, and they're up for grabs, and both parties need to do what they can to reach them. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Andrew Miller. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, what I'm hearing a lot tonight is that the way to get young people involved in politics is to make it fun. Um, I'm from Chicago, and I've been involved in a lot of youth empowerment programs that have tried to get youth in, both in the inner city and the suburbs involved. And the number one things kids my age say uh, is that they're kind of interested in substantive problem solving. Uh, and that really it's not about you know, rock bands and it's not about celebrities. It's 
about relevance. Um, and I think that there's been too much focus on getting kids involved in the game of politics, that is campaigning, which I've done a lot of and it's fun. Not enough in getting kids involved in the actual problem-solving mechanisms of governance, the reason governments and politics are important to begin with. I'd like to hear what the panel has to think about um, reinvigorating the American media, especially in its focus towards youth, um, to put more of a focus on what government actually does. What does it fix? What doesn't it fix? Why doesn't it fix it? And less on who's going to win the next election. Because I think that would get young people involved in politics in a very meaningful, sustainable way. Roger, if you were, uh, if you were running campaigns today, how would you tap into that? Well, there are two problems going on. One is, is the media does tend to cover the surface. Uh, uh, the the uh, electronic media is a time medium. We go on, this program has a time, it's going to be off in 10 minutes. Uh, it's like a rock skipping off the surface of a creek to a large extent. So you have to read, but about 19% of the kids under, your young people under 35, pick up a newspaper and read. Uh, so. Uh, but I they go to the internet, right? They go to the internet, but the internet's full of blogs, which is opinion. They have to be able to, do, mm -hmm. to distinguish. They have to read enough uh, to, to be able to distinguish what the blog is trying to achieve. I spent two days at an internet conference recently, and I was amazed because I asked about the, the standards of journalism used. And they say, well, they're not necessary. Bloggers are correct, like they did with the CBS issue. They, they blogged in and said that wasn't correct and they fixed it. But I get 1,500 email a day from people who are trying to push a point of view, that are dr driving out of a boiler room, writing the same letter, uh, same special interest groups, et cetera. I don't think that the premise of your argument is wrong. I think it is about substance. But you know, you can argue that, that uh, you learn a lot from Jon Stewart, uh, even though you can still have a laugh. Mm -hmm. But I think that it starts with the education system. By the time you get to the media, it's too late. If they don't teach civics, they don't teach geography, if they don't require learning, you're not ready by the time you turn on the evening news. That's not going to solve your problem. Hi, my name is Stephanie Shaheen, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is to, exactly to your point. Given the different avenues through which we can access information, and I think my generation and the generation bef after me is so focused on tuning into bloggers and the internet. How do we ensure that people are getting more than just opinion, that they're getting the kind of substantive information we would have gotten from the nightly news if we were tuning in? And what can we as uh, committed students try to do to make sure that our peers and the people behind us are finding channels where they can really access more than just opinion so we don't just see Jon Stewart as our new news anchor, but we're able to access information in a way that pr previous generations were able to access. Jimu? Well, I want to actually start by saying I absolutely agree that it's about being relevant. It's not just about being fun. And I think in the 2004 election, when P. Diddy said, vote or die, and Rock the Vote did a draft campaign, that's relevant. That's life or death. And young people showed that they actually cared about that, and because they would. Um, I think that you know, the media, I probably would say that the media has more responsibility than um, where Roger alluded to as far as, well, they need to get the education before they get to watching whatever it is, Crossfire, or watching Fox in the morning. That the media has the responsibility because this generation isn't picking up newspapers, and they're not going to. It's a thing of the past for them. So are we, as a country, just going to stay in the past and expect um, the campaigns expect the politicians to figure out a way to force newspapers and force this information down their throats, or are we as a country with the media in hand, nonprofit organizations, going to find ways of getting this information through the vehicles that young people pay attention to, that young people come in contact with on a daily basis? And that's, you know, that's the, I think, success of the 2004 campaign. We were able to use those vehicles to get that information out there. Um, we had a small group discussion before this session started, and this question came up about you know, voters and how educated they are and how we can get them. And you know, I want to agree with um, my colleague, Hans Riemer from Rock the Vote, who said that you know, we don't live in a society that you know, dictates that if you're going to vote, you have to have a master's degree. If you're going to vote, 
you have to have um, read the newspaper for the past six months. You know, someone who lives in you know, the Ninth Ward in Houston needs to, the same type of resources and services, and even if they didn't read the newspaper, they know what is right for them, what is good for them, and they can look at a candidate and say, this candidate's gonna provide those services. So it's not so much only about the education, it's about the access, making it relevant in their lives, and communicating to them how they can become a part of the process. Let me just say one thing. The average age of a news viewer in America on television is 60 years old. Wow. So while the media may want to do this, the television set is in many ways as irrelevant to the 18 to 34 year olds as the newspaper. Uh, so there have to be other ways designed to, to, to reach them. That's what I'm saying. We have time for just one more question. We're going to go to the bleachers if we can. Uh. Hi. Hi. My name is Adam Estes, and I'm the president of Current Magazine. We're a magazine for students that any student in the country can contribute to. Stay, Adam, lean the end of the microphone a little more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> We're, I'm the president of a magazine called Current. We're a magazine that any student in the country can contribute to. Um, another a vice president had the, the same idea and happened to call it the same thing. But it's the same idea, it's the idea of citizen journalism, the idea that we, as a, as a generation, going into the future of the media, have the opportunity to speak out, and not just speak out with our opinions, but speak out with the stories that we have to tell. What do you think is the responsibility for our generation with new media, going into the future, and being behind the driver's seat of a very, very powerful vehicle? To the whole panel, and to Mr. Cronkite. I think the responsibility is Young people, this generation needs to tell our story. So many times the story is young people are apathetic, they're not engaged, they don't care. When you have things like current television, and I assume the magazine you're talking about as well, telling the story of young people are engaged, they are volunteering in higher rates than any other generation. They care about what happens to their neighbors to, in their community, and they are acting on those concerns in different ways. It doesn't mean that they're not concerned. We need to tell our own story because we can't depend on the other traditional forms of media to tell the story. And once we do it in an effective way, they'll pick up on it. They follow what we do. We're trendsetters. Let me ask you one quick question. The young people only, the students who are here, actually two parts to it. How many of you get most of your information about the political arena from the internet as opposed to newspapers and television? Let's have a raising of the hand. Majority. Internet as opposed to. And finally, in the last election cycle, I thought one of the real advantageous developments was the great number of debates that we had uh, on the Democratic side among the candidates, because you were able to sort out who believed in what, how well they could handle themselves, see their mind at work had played out on Fox and MSNBC and all the cable channels. How many of the students watched any of those debates? That's a great number. And with that, I want to say thank you on behalf of the panel okay, I'll watch the wrong and for all of your there attention. You and I want to introduce now a man who's been at the center of American politics for my entire adult lifetime. <laughs> he was there when the torch was passed. And he said in that memorable speech in Madison Square Garden, the dream shall never die. He is the senior senator from Massachusetts, Edward Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you very much to um, Tom Brokaw. Very special thanks uh, to Tom Brokaw uh, this evening for making such an extraordinary difference. And I want to thank Roger and Jamu and Paul Begala. And I, thought, I want to thank Governor Shaheen for all of her wonderful work here at the Institute of Politics. She's doing an outstanding job. And we're very, very grateful, grateful to her. Dean Elwood, we thank you uh, so much as well as Dean of the School. I was, uh, like all of you, listening to all of the comments that were made, the questions and the answers and also from our video participants. One comment that Arnold Schwarzenegger said that he favored term limits is something I just can't go for. And uh, 
When I think of George Magazine, I think of that first spectacular uh, cover, which as Paul Begala said, was Cindy Crawford dressed up as George, as George Washington with her belly button showing. And that came out and the Washington Post reliable source uh, did another picture which was me dressed up with George Washington showing my belly button. And <laughs> so I asked uh, George, <coughs> John, whether he'd rather have had that on the uh, cover and without obviously missing a beat, he said he uh, stuck with his journalistic uh, decision earlier. Uh, at this uh, extraordinary institute, uh, it is really focused on um, the importance of trying to have young people involved in uh, public service, but to try and bring together uh, some of the very uh, bright and smart young people, both political, all political uh, views, uh, that uh, are also going to try and marriage ideas with political action. And that was something that uh, President Kennedy felt very strongly about. And I think those of us who are involved in the advisory committee uh, saw how John Kennedy Jr. thought that there ought to be the extra dimension, and that is how the culture was going to impact uh, the politics of our time. Not only the ideas of our times and having uh, young people that were going to be involved in politics, but also about how culture was going to involve. It was really a, an odd thought at that time, one that was really uh, not really embraced. And he went ahead and founded uh, this uh, extraordinary magazine, which uh, at the time, political journals were on one part of the book stand and pop culture on the other end. And he really brought them uh, together in a very important, creative way and uh, reached out to a whole new generation of young people uh, to talk about uh, these kinds of issues. And uh, now we see it uh, reflected in these wonderful questions that were asked this evening and these extraordinary uh, responses. And uh, I think uh, he was uh, really far ahead of his time. He brought uh, such imagination and creativity and courage and fun and uh, initiative to this uh, undertaking. And he was never uh, discouraged uh, right from the very beginning. He saw something that was out there. And I think uh, today, both in listening to the questions and the answers, uh, we know today uh, how young people and others are getting their information. It's not only uh, through uh, the idea of the internet, but it is also those blogs, the journalism's on the blogs. All of that is out there, and this has all been accepted by everyone that's involved uh, in either whether they're producing the news or commenting on the news or those that are involved in uh, the political life at this time. He was far ahead of the time. Uh, this evening would have been an evening that uh, John Kennedy Jr. very much uh, would have enjoyed. And it couldn't have been put together unless it was Caroline, who brought us all together here. And uh, as a great source of shared love with uh, my nephew John and continues to be a wonderful inspiration to all the members of our family. We love you. Thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. Went up. 